Curious Lloyd. You are probably going to die, ideally from old age, unless the universe concocts some terrible, painful, inescapable fatality just for you. Although, there's no such thing as a totally inescapable scenario. But once in a while, a person finds themselves face to face with death and decides to pull the Grim Reaper's robe and cheat death. A paraglider sleeps away across the upper atmosphere. In February 2007, German paraglider Uwe Wisnerska was sucked into an unexpected thunderstorm in Australia. As testimony to the storm's intense hatred of flying people, Chinese paraglider He Zhongping had been pulled into the exact same storm earlier that day. His lifeless body was later found 50 miles away. So, not content with one victim, the storm pulled Uwe mid-flight and dragged her higher and higher into the air. Wisnerska started from an already unnerving 2,500 foot altitude, but the storm was lifting her at a pace of 67 foot per second. At 3,000 foot, her exposed skin was frostbitten. Her glasses like the rest of her clothes were covered in ice so thick that she couldn't even make out her own glider, which the violent weather kept collapsing, so she had to constantly battle the controls to keep it in working condition. At 20,000 feet, the air temperature was down to minus 58 degrees and ice encased her entire body. This was inconvenient, as was the lack of oxygen, which caused her to pass out. Although you don't really expect to wake up from a nap like that. The previous record altitude for a paraglider was 24,000 feet. Wisnerska blew past it and kept blowing. Geese fly at 27,000 feet. So did Wisnerska, briefly on her way to 29,000 feet, which is the exact height of the summit of Mount Everest. But at this point, the storm started getting a little frustrated. It continued to lift her, but now to 30,000 feet, just to see if she could survive the cruising height of a passenger jet, which she could. At 32,000 feet, the storm finally gave up and she began her descent. At 23,000 feet, Wisnerska woke from the most turbulent nap, but she realized that she had no way to break or steer, especially when her gloves and hands were frozen. She rode out the storm, and hoped that she'd eventually land safely, which she did, 40 miles away from her starting point. Apart from some bruising and frostbite, damage to her extremities, she was perfectly fine. This is probably because she was unconscious for an estimated 40 to 60 minutes of flight. Now you see, your heart rate slows when you're out cold, and this likely played out a huge part in her survival. Jacob Miller sleeps off headshots. Please note that some of the details in this story come from the first-hand account of a man that got shot in the head. It's your call whether it makes his story less believable or more awesome. The Battle of Chickamauga in Tennessee during the Civil War was the second biggest Union defeat after Gettysburg. With around 36,000 casualties in total, one of those casualties was Jacob Miller who caught a confederate musket ball between the eyes on September the 19th, 1863. Miller's Union allies thought he was dead and left him behind. The confederate army thought the same and marched right over him as they pushed forward. They didn't know that headshots were something that Miller could simply sleep off. After he woke up with a brand new hole in his forehead, he realized that he was now at the back of the confederate line. So he used his gun as a crutch and waddled along parallel to the fighting until he could pass back over to the Union side. Because of his uniform was completely drenched in blood, the Confederates didn't even recognize him as an enemy. After making it back to home turf, Miller was rushed to the hospital and promptly had the bullet taken out of his skull. Although the surgeon shrugged and said, you're probably going to die anyway. But in fact, Union troops were about to fall back and the doctor deemed Miller too sick to move. So it looked like he'd been left behind, but Miller was having none of it, so the man who had been shot in the face got up and started retreating with the rest of them. His face was so badly swollen that he had to manually lift his eyelids to see where he was going, but Miller kept plodding along with the retreating troops, with zero intention or either dying or stopping, but eventually, an ambulance wagon got the hint and picked him up. Nine months after the incident, doctors finally got around to removing the shot from his head, at least most of it. The bullet hole never really closed, and although Miller would go on to live a long life, he'd spend the next three decades literally sweating bullets, as pieces of the shot would occasionally make their way away from the wound. A 
a man elbows his way out of a watery grave. In early 2017, Jake Garrow was plowing the snow from an ice road in Ontario, Canada, when his skid loader hit an unexpected thin patch and plunged into the frozen depths, dragging Garrow with it. This is not something people generally shrug off. The number killed in Ontario in the first few months of 2017 alone is depressingly a large one. But for most of us, sinking a hundred foot to the bottom of a frozen lake is a terrible way for our bitchery to open. But Garrow is not like most of us. As he sank, he scrubbed around for the cord release that popped the back window out, a design feature created exactly for this situation. Unfortunately, he couldn't find it, what with the being submerged in frozen water and the complete darkness and all. So rather than fumbling around futilely, while water rushed into his cab, Garrow smashed the back window out with his elbow. But now he was free from his skid loader and still had to swim a hundred feet through pitch black ice covered water and he hoped like hell that he could find the hole he fell through. Miraculously, he managed it and emerged from the ice with little more than a perforated eardrum. But it wasn't over yet. Garrow had to walk a mile to the main road in soaking wet clothes with a wind chill of minus 22 degrees and then stand at the side of the road freezing. He only managed to get a lift to the hospital because of a familiar contractor happened to drive by. But luckily, Garrow's story earned him some attention from the Canadian government. He said that officials have contacted him since he reported the incident and the Ministry of the Environment has told him that he has to lift the skid loader out of their lake by June. Everything that could go wrong with a spaceship landing did. In 1969, at the height of the space race, Russian cosmonaut Boris Volonov was flying a solar re entry into Earth's atmosphere on Soyuz 5. He was returning after dropping two space colleagues off another spaceship. During re entry, the equipment module on the Soyuz 5 failed to detach, which messed up the balance of the spacecraft and caused it to turn around. This was a problem because the heat bursting through the Earth's atmosphere was expected to burn away around 3 inches of the special ablator coating on the thicker side of the vessel, which had a good 6 inches of it. But unfortunately, Volonov was now screaming at Earth backwards, and the side of his ship facing the flames was a mere inch thick, and the screwy trajectory also submitted his body to 9 times the gravitational force of Earth, making all attempts to fix the situation borderline impossible. Volonov was facing almost certain doom until he suddenly noticed something. The malfunctioning part of the ship that had failed to detach was also getting sheared off by the intense heat. Summoning all of his strengths, battling 9 Gs, he managed to maneuver the Soyuz 5 to its correct position in the nick of time. So you'd think that's problem solved, right? Well, there was a new problem. The ship's parachute had taken damage and could only partially deploy. Another newer problem. The rockets designed to soften the landing had also completely failed. Soyuz 5 hit the ground like a meteor. Volonov survived this as well, but was thrown around the cabin and broke a number of his teeth. So the newest problem was that Soyuz 5 had landed in the Ural Mountains, far away from its intended spot in Kazakhstan. The weather outside was a cool minus 36 degrees, so you'd think he'd be dead long before rescue, unless he figured out something yet again. When the rescue team arrived hours later, they found an empty Soyuz 5 following a set of footprints prepped with blood and bits of teeth. They found Volonov warming himself up in a hut, which he managed to locate by following a distant column of smoke. His only comment to the rescuers, is my hair grey. Scientists witness a volcanic eruption from inside the volcano. In January 1993, a group of scientists from 15 different countries gathered in Colombia to assess the danger of the 9,000 feet Galaras volcano, which had erupted irregularly for centuries. Yet the volcanologists felt it was fairly safe. It had erupted six months ago, and no seismic activity indicated it would again. So 16 people ventured into its cone to gather samples of information. So, do you care to guess how that went for them? To its credit, the volcano waited until the most dramatic possible moment to launch the assault. An hour earlier, and all the scientists would have been instantly killed as they stood right at the inner crater. An hour later, and they might have been at the relatively safe distance. But no, 
Galaras waited until they just stopped working for the day and still had a slim chance to get away. But then, and only then, did the ground start to rumble. Galaras erupted hard enough to send a 90-story cloud of ash, smoke, and gas into the air. One engineer was hit with a blast of heat that reduced him to ash. Two others were instantly turned into gas. More yet were bombarded and burned to death by the scalding rocks. When the dust settled, none of the 16 members of the expedition had been killed, and the survivors were pummeled halfway to oblivion. Dr. Stanley Williams, the leader of the group, was standing right by the crater's rim when the eruption came. He managed to avoid the heat blast, but was still standing in the maelstrom of white hot boulders and all sorted smaller, but no less dangerous elements. Clearly, he took a rock to the head, instantly shattering his skull and sending bone fragments deep into his brain. He managed to get away, only to have his legs savaged by the next rock bombardment. That might have been the end if it wasn't for two of his colleagues, Marta Kalvash and Patty Moles. Kalvach and Moles had inexplicably decided to climb towards the volcanic eruption to check for survivors. They managed to locate Williams and dragged him to safety. Apart from the burns, broken limbs and shattered skull, Williams was fine after they removed a piece of his brain that had too much skull in it.